Hello. Hello. Well, thank you all, and it's a, a real honor uh, to be here. It's my first Closure X. <laughs> Hopefully not the last one. <laughs> um, I also have to warn you, I'm awake for about 42, 43 hours now, so um, if I lose my thread at any point in time, please uh, knock me back awake or whatever. <laughs> um, I also have to say I really struggled with that title um, for this talk because A, this is really what I kind of want to talk about, the spirit of closure, but then it's December and, you know, like maybe it's more the Advent spirit. We are all sharing knowledge here and, or maybe it's just in the spirit of closure rather than the spirit of closure because if I'm honest, I actually have not used closure that much recently. <laughs> um, so, but this may be more fitting, but then maybe, so would that be like re really what, is the essence of closure if you take away the language. There is still a lot left, so maybe we can talk about that. Or maybe we are just at a group meeting. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I thought we really kind of go with that and see how we can, uh, how far we can take that vibe. So here's an imaginary questionnaire you all have to fill out now in your head. And I'm sure there will be some overlap, not definitely the same ones, but these were kind of the things which brought me to closure. Like there was a book called The Joy of Closure. Who has read that? Hands up. Yeah, good. <laughs> Isn't there a second edition as well? No? Yeah. Um, then obviously the, the different uh, core APIs and sequence abstractions, all that stuff we all know. I'm not now going through this point by point. Um, but obviously also it's about people. Closure has always been, I think, and I'm not like now claiming authority of the community, but I think for most people who, who came to Closure, they have very different backgrounds and what really made Closure kind of stick with them is the people involved in closure. So I think we all need a, a <laughs> especially in this day and time as well, <laughs> uh, with all the stuff which is going on around us, we should never forget what really made it happen or who made it happen. Um, so here is a patient file I have been given. Um, so. This is, we are in our Closurians Anonymous meeting here. Um, so a little, just to frame a little bit of discussion of our therapy session here, um, this is kind of the background of this hypothetical patient, KS. Um, when asked about what were his most formative years, it's really kind of those two groups and obviously this is not a personal history, this is my personal history of, of programming. And it's more or less to, to give you an idea that I've always been kind of swimming between different language camps and I never really had like, for instance, a lot of my peers um, who really kind of been using the same two, three languages their entire life or career and I just, that, that never worked with me. <laughs> and I don't think that will ever work with me. But what's interesting here is that obviously you would think like as a kid, you know, like the first time you, you get in touch with computers, of course these are formative years, but what really struck me when I learned Clojure was, I've been programming for 20 something, 21, 22 years already, and I felt like a complete novice again, and I absolutely loved that feeling. And um, so I kind of was at that moment just like when I was 13, 14, I knew I want to have this in my life and I want to not do anything else really for a while. And that's what I did. Um, just to also give a little bit more background about this um, period, a lot of the projects I'm going to show, they all kind of started from learnings 
uh, learned from those languages and environments. Um, but in terms of programming, it was really those two regions in time. So it begins. Um, let's very quickly just give an overview of that thing project um, John already mentioned. This is an excerpt of a timeline. I know it's not very clear to see, but um, this is also on the website. It's kind of a timeline of the different libraries. So here's 2011, that's when I started with Clojure. And I always believed that the best way of learning is to set yourself some form of deadline or a project and then just dive in straight, like in the deep end. And that's really what I kind of did. And I started with this geometry library and then kind of started trying to find work, which was back then very hard, especially in the field I've been operating, to find anyone who is willing to kind of give me the benefit of doubt and allow me to use a language no one has ever heard about. <laughs> and not just was that very risky on their behalf, was also risky on my behalf because back then none of, especially for graphics oriented stuff, none apart from the Java uh, system libraries really kind of existed. And it was really like living in a desert. <laughs> and, <coughs> and it's really kind of sad that it took so long, like so many years, only like kind of when I stopped with Closure that there's slowly a community now uh, forming in this field. <coughs> so maybe I will be back. Um, but I preempt here. Um, so just very quickly, the like thing project itself is a polyglot undertaking, but it started out from all those different closure libraries, which very quickly grew to around 20, 22 uh, different libraries. Not all of them are really meant for user consumption directly, like direct user libraries are maybe half of that. Um, what was interesting as well to many, and especially also to myself, was that I kind of used learning closure as an excuse to just completely go wild and don't do any of the things I used to do when I worked it with Java or other libraries, uh, languages, and really tried completely new tools. Like I learned, taught myself Emacs, I taught myself org mode, and I learned about all those like old kind of research from the 70s and 60s. And I decided I will write all my source code in this so-called literal, literate, not literal, <laughs> uh, literate programming style. And s just to find out how far I can take it. And it actually was so addictive that I really just kept going with it. Um, yeah, so. The reason why I just gave this overview now is because there are a few types of problems and kind of use cases those libraries are used for. And also my work is based around which uh, are maybe not the traditional closure use cases. And I just want to illustrate some of them here uh, during this talk. So let's start with a very simple don't worry, it won't turn into a maths talk, but <laughs> there will be some maths involved. Um, who can tell me what that is? It's just a simple sine wave multiplied with a cosine, which is its partner function. So we have essentially a graph of two functions. One of the waves moves along the x-axis, the other one moves along the y-axis. And what we visualize is kind of their product. Yeah, but we can take those waves or those those planes of waves themselves, and we can say if this is a 3D space, which it obviously is here. Imagine we have a plane in this uh, direction, another one here, and another one like this. So we basically cover the entire three-dimensional space, and if we add them up and kind of just kind of clip through it, cut, like take a cross section out, then this would look suddenly like this. And if we move that cut slightly higher up, like just kind of lift it up, then suddenly the pattern is changing. So 
we get now those holes, and, but we can also see there are those kind of overgrowths happening. And this function is called the gyroid formula because it's essentially the 3D equivalent of a 2D chain. If you think about your keychain, that locks up in just one direction. Like this function creates links in all directions. So it's unbreakable, essentially. But it, it's really just sine waves. And from this very simple formula, we can basically, uh, if you don't know if this is big enough to see, I can zoom in as well. Um, so I, I'm not now doing a, a maths crash course here, but <laughs> we basically take the dot product of two vectors and um, add them together or take the absolute value from this. So basically just ignore the sign. And you can write this out like this as well, which makes it a bit easier to see. So it's just very obvious that it's just a, a sum of products. And if you com uh, combine this and translate it to closure, you could write it like this. So we have those three simple functions. And that already shows how you can take, make that journey from reading, for instance, some form of formula on Wikipedia. And if you know even just some rudimentary maths, it's very easy to translate this into closure and uh, at least play around with it. Now, the next question is how do you visualize that? Because it's all good and fine to look at numbers in the REPL, but that will not ever show you how that thing looks like. So you, you really, some of the problems you really need to explore visually, as you cannot understand them. And that's not just for arbitrary like maths equations like this, but especially when you do deal with real world data. So this is where the thing library comes in. So here's just another version, so I've been jumping too fast. And um, here we can also combine all those three functions into one. That will not just make it a little bit faster as well, but um, potentially I find it easier to reason about than having those three uh, in this case. <laughs> In other cases, it's probably better to really refactor it into smaller units. Um, so, but where, where the geometry library comes into play now is that we can actually take a sample that function at a, like custom resolution, whatever we want, and basically evaluate that function at every given point, say, within a cubic space. So. Because it's a function, it should always produce the same, it's a pure function, it should always produce the same result, no matter where, um, how often we call that function for the same inputs. And if we start visualizing this with different resolutions, you can slowly see here, the finer we go, the, the more detail we get. So. If you look at that exponential counter here in the bot and the top left, let's go back here. In this version, we only have a grid resolution of eight by eight by eight, which is basically nothing. Yeah? So there's no level of detail, no comprehension of how beautiful that actual structure looks like. Even at twice the resolution, still nothing, still nothing, still nothing. But Every time we double the resolution, we actually have to compute eight times more data. Eight times more. <laughs> yeah. So you can see how performance in a language plays a huge part in a problem like this. For instance, this is 1024 by 1024 by 1024 crit cells. So if you are naive, or if you evaluate this naively, like really going through every single <laughs> uh, tiny crit cell, then this probably takes a few hours. I have never tried it in Clojure, but I, that's my guess. Because even if you are a bit more intelligent how you evaluate it, and if you look here at the, uh, the level of um, finer resolution, is actually important because if you start at a low resolution, you already know 
there will be no pattern in areas which are already empty. So if I only constrict my search to the areas which are actually filled in this case, then I only need to reevaluate those regions and I can actually save me huge amounts of work. Um, but what's really interesting with this kind of approach to geometry is, is that we don't deal with vertices or polygons or normals and all that stuff. It's really just kind of a 3D grid of data, just like you would get from an MRI scan. And because of that, you can apply all sorts of interesting kind of transformations to the data. And because this specific function is, for instance, pure maths, we can change the scale independently from the outer geometry. So this is, for instance, that was a research project I did, I don't know, like back when I started with Clojure, um, about 3D printing inner structures and make their inner supports more uh, stable, but at the same time more lightweight. Um, but the same function you could visualize much more nicely with a proper renderer. So this was another project I did in 2013, or started in 2013. So that's an OpenCL-driven renderer for volumetric data, which you can use from the REPL. So you, you calculate, you write your normal closure code, you create like a, a huge array, essentially, and then you send that array to the graphics card, and a few seconds later, you get images like this, all from the REPL. Um, so here's, for instance, that's one of the standard uh, 3D test objects from Stanford University, which everyone uses, the super high-res uh, clay dragon. Um, but moving on. So um, another related class to, to this, and still using volumetric ways of, of um, thinking about data, is that we, a class of so-called sine distance functions. So in this example here, you can see the function of a sphere, and that function would return you, given any point in space, what is the distance to the surface of that sphere. So obviously, when you're outside the sphere, that distance should be positive. If you are on the surface of the sphere, the distance should be zero, because you are on the surface. And if you are inside the sphere, it would be negative. And what we can then simply do is saying if the distance is negative, we actually take the remainder of that negative distance and it kind of starts folding inside itself, which is really weird to think about. Like try to visualize it taking a sphere and kind of wrapping it in itself infinitely. It, it's really where the idea of fractals starts from as well. Um, but I use those kind of functions for um, illustration project or commission for Holo magazine a few years ago. So here this is slightly un we, we get back to sign distance function, but this is slightly unrelated um, approach for the same project, where that logo Holo was actually evolved out of a so-called genetic program. So a genetic programming approach is where you have um, kind of a population of possible functions or statements, and you initially assemble a program which is completely random. So most of those programs will basically crash immediately. They will perform absolutely nothing but waste heat. <laughs> and then the idea is that you have lots of them and you kind of crossbreed them after each run and you have some form of evaluating how fit they are. And then we can kind of really breed those programs to, to kind of become better and better in that fitness function. And the fitness function in this case was to trace out that path holo. And what the way you have to read that visualization here is that going up is essentially the number of generations only like the top generation is after about uh, 1,200 generations. And you can see all the resulting paths and previous attempts which create this complete uh, spaghetti mess um, 
further down. So, but back to distance function is that using the same approach, so randomly generated programs, in this case really just simple randomly generated mass functions, and kind of layering them uh, creates this almost synthetic tissue type. There, there's like this, I was really interested in this interplay between something which looks biological but isn't really, but there's definitely so much detail in there. Um, oops, how do I zoom in here? So if you look here, you have some regular patterns and then it goes into complete chaos. There are some strange fragments around and I found it very interesting. I could spend days with that. <laughs> um, most of those, most of that time is obviously spent waiting for the process to finish because this is a super painstaking, slow uh, process. And you really cannot predict what will come out because it, you all start from randomness. And how do, how do you charge random mass function for a fitness where you have no idea about what you kind of want? So it, it's really kind of, having an environment which Clojure provides, and the reason why I'm talking about those kind of projects because I absolutely love Clojure for this kind of working. Um, because it allows you to really go into a dialogue much more than any other language I've used. Um, so here are some other variations based on cellular automata. Who has ever heard of them? Yeah, good, game of life. Google it if you don't know. But this is really just one version. This is not game of life here. Um, what this actually is based on is uh, this guy, Niels Al Bali, uh, Baricelli, who was uh, working under John van Neumann at the IAS. And he actually is credited with really being the kind of pioneer of artificial life. So. His experiments, have to zoom out a little bit. So this is not closure, obviously, this is algol. <laughs> um, I don't think any of us speak algol, but it should be obvious enough. Um, he was interested um, in taking the idea of symbiotic uh, reproduction and simulate that and see what comes out. Like he wanted to kind of a, confirm, but also detest uh, Darwin's theories. So he started writing computer experiments in 51 or 53. I can't remember one of the two years. So really early on, and he used all the downtime of the machines at the IAS when the rest of John van Neumann's team didn't use them to basically run his experiments overnight. And like, if you look at that code, it seems super simple. So it simply has a kind of sick cyclical universe or a generation which kind of wraps in itself, which in this case is 512 cells. And then for every uh, array item in that generation, you basically add the, the, the content of that cell with the current counter and you do some form of modulo operation. So here he kind of wraps it around in this line. And depending if that result is zero or not, that those two numbers start reproducing. And what, they, what their offspring is, is basically the remainder of that modulo operation. And you continue doing this until the remainder will be zero. So that means some of the number pairs will reproduce multiple times in the next generation, and then you continue over and over. So it sounds really super boring, but when you visualize the process, so time is going here from left to right, you can see the very first generation, there are hardly any numbers there. And then after a very small amount of time, you suddenly get those amazing patterns appearing. So if I go back here, do you see my mouse cursor here? So that next image is just assumed in area here of this what I'm tracing with my mouse. And 
it, it's quite incredible. So every color in this image is just a different number. So I used numbers between minus 18 and plus 18. Um, don't ask me why, but just... <laughs> no, uh, actually I remember because if you add them together you get 36 and if you think about the color wheel, you have 360 degrees, so that was one, one color per 10 degrees on the color wheel, that's why. <laughs> Numerology. <laughs> it's because three plus three equals six, and it's the number of the beast. Uh, <laughs> like, there you have it. Oops. Um, so, but I, I find those systems really interesting and as I say, like you can spend days and weeks with them without ever getting bored. Um, another s related problem here is, and I actually built an entire one and a half year long project on this function, on this single function, <laughs> um, which basically is the so-called de Jong strange attractor so that's again using just sine and cosine and four extra numbers. And then you compute, you, you take a random input number for x and y, it produces a result, and then you take that result and feed it back into the same function as is, and that's it. And you do this as for as long as you want, and what comes out is images like this. So obviously here's some user interface around um, this, this is a development screenshot where the whole idea was to make this all sound reactive as well. And finally, you, after several hundreds of millions of iterations, you would get frames like this. So really, this is a billion iterations of that function. <laughs> and the, we, like this is resized to really just fit on my screen, but the original is the biggest image I've ever did, which is 60,000 by 60,000 pixels. Um, it's huge. And obviously, you, on, on this case, you, you can't do this on laptops anymore. You need to outsource it to the uh, cloud. So this was way before ClojureScript was invented or maybe it was invented already, it wasn't released yet. <laughs> so this is all like a traditional closure uh, backend with a JavaScript front end application. But I built this whole um, basically render manager where the client, it was Leeds College of Music, their identity where they allowed students and staff to upload their own piece of music they would choose one of the presets, you can see this here in a minute. So you upload your sound file, give it a name and a description, what it's used for, like internal signage or online use, and then it would kick off a render job which can take four or five hours, depending what they use for as a rendering machine. And then it would start transcoding and creating all the different versions of the assets. So, and, this all, and that all was controlled by that desktop application as well. So, but a similar approach here, and still about exponential growth, is this Twitter bot, which is not online at the moment, but you can, it's on GitHub, so if you just go here to Thingybot, there's the link to the repository. And the idea here is that we type in small commands or small programs, really. Like in this case here, the program starts after that number 90, and that create uh, the rest of that tweet basically defines that image. So this is the famous uh, dragon curve. Here, who knows what curve this one is? It's a very famous one. It's called the Hilbert curve. Ever heard of that? So Hilbert curve is, is a really interesting class of problems because it's a so-called space filling curve. And it means no matter how, how many times you kind of fold it on itself, it will always perfectly fill all available space. The reason why this one doesn't properly fill all available space is because usually the corners are 90 degrees 
but in this case, I configured it to 85, so it kind of uh, starts unfolding. Um, so, but what, what is really fascinating is how little is needed to define those kind of really super complex structures. Also, if you look at this one, this is one single continuous line. Like, don't get sidetracked by the different colors. This is just, the colors are simply visualizing kind of the, the beginning of the curve is actually here. Oops. So here, do you see? This is the beginning of the curve, and then somewhere over here will be the end. I'm not now going to find it. It's like, <laughs> find Wally. -E. <laughs> um, Wally -E is somewhere. Um, but you, you get the idea. So here's also uh, Penrose Tires. Who has ever heard of Penrose Tires? He won his Nobel Prize for it, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so there, there's a sort of uh, patterns which can be generated with those so-called Lindemeyer systems. They are named L systems, the short name after this uh, Hungarian mathematician from the 60s. And he defined that system where you simply define those short rules and then every, so a simple rule is here, and then every symbol in that um, rule gets expanded over and over. So, and again, this is something you can very easily experiment with in closure because all you need is you know, some valid symbols. So I made up symbols here and then translate them into keywords. I also have some simple default rules like move forward, turn left, turn right, and restore and store my um, kind of where I am in space. And then we can continue Writing a simple pass function for a rule like this simply means using the built-in replace function. So closure kind of has this battery included, batteries included approach. And with very little effort, we can basically work with those things. What is needed here is obviously the visualization part. I'm not going to show this to you now. But again, what's interesting here is how quickly that system grows. So after just one replacement, so basically the first one would be just saying start, but after the first one, start is replaced with X, then the, after doing one more expansion, we get actually the real rule of X, and if we do it one more time, we get already this huge thing, and after six more generations, we are already at over 218,000 uh, symbols. So that, that thing grows incredibly quickly. And if you think about modeling, um, not just geo, like kind of stuff you would give to a 3D modeler, but actually really kind of when we get as a discipline, uh, speaking here about computational design to a state where we better understand natural phenomena and natural process and how we can combine them to actually really uh, generate forms, we can actually literally start breeding uh, objects. So this was here an example. This object can be visualized as this tree of transformations. So we start with a simple single cube and then what you see here is basically a visualization of the AST, so the abstract syntax tree to transform that cube. And you can see there are here a lot of self-similar looking trees. Even not knowing what each of those dots does, you can tell from the structure that those programs here probably do something very similar. So and if you look at this structure here, you can see that's probably some of those antennas or something. You, you can take a guess. I'm not even sure myself now after all those years. But it's the, the point is that because I can treat this entire object as this tree, I could just say, OK, I have uh, some form of system where I transplant tree branches from one object to another, and I will see what comes out. And that's exactly what kind of, not exactly, but it's in principle what, what happens with uh, biological systems as well. And here's just to explain as well how that object actually grows. So this is simply visualizing by stepping down the tree of um, 
basically into descending along the tree levels to until there's nothing left. Here's another example um, which creates this kind of interesting structure. And also, if you unfold that tree, you can see if you are quick, it all starts with that one segment up here, and then that kind of starts wrapping around. <laughs> I have to hurry up. <laughs> um, so next topic, linked data and visualization. So a lot of people, or not a lot, but some of you might have known some of those products I just showed already. But what is not so often talked about is the, the kind of uh, overlap to more or less uh, real the data management, not just the visualization part. So this was an old project um, from 2013, I think, where I worked with the ODI, which is the Open Data Institute here in Shoreditch, just up the road, um, about uh, visualizing different data sets about London, uh, the different boroughs and their spending habits and crime statistics, all sorts of things. So that entire map is done in closure and is actually all just using, there are no hand-drawn assets. Everything is coming from the National Statistics Office, in this case here, and the London Data Store. So the height of it, you have to kind of read this, both of those, a bit like a bar graph. So this was an animated map for a presentation where we basically had a timeline and as the different data points changed, those different boroughs kind of oscillated like a surface of water. <laughs> Very poetic. <laughs> um, less poetic though are the actual uh, data sets. So this one was, um, let me compare, yes. So this one is knife crime in London and again, this was just a pre-visualization. This is not really uh, a final output here. This was just for us to get a better overview. But again, closure was perfect for uh, using this. And you have timeline along X and the boroughs sorted um, over the rows, essentially. And obviously, we have no labels here in this case. So I will also not take a guess anymore. Somewhere southeast London, that's all I remember. Um, where you have the, the outliers. Uh, this is crime against women or violence against women against women. So again, you can see here this is from uh, 2011 to 2013, the data set, so summer to summer, two years worth. So this must be here somewhere halfway through. So what period was that? Olympics, possibly. Um, this one is interesting. This one is binge drinking, <laughs> sorted by borough. And this is one is easy. We all know which borough that is. Westminster, <laughs> So It's so. it's basically. But you can see how extreme it is. I mean, again. It doesn't need numbers and labels. It's just the, the, the contrast between the next one. Um, I think the next one is actually here, the city. Because when all the bank bonuses come, it's there, well, hey. <laughs> um, this one is, um, I will skip this. We don't have time. But th th there are two libraries in the collection which deal with, with semantic web applications. And this is, for instance, how the query engine works internally, but also how you can infer new meaning from existing graph data. So all the black arrows and, um, are basically known information, which you actually actively imported into your model, but all the red relationships are inferred from a set of rules over those uh, black existing ones. So it's quite interesting from even very little known information, if you have the right metadata relationship model, you can infer a lot of secondary meaning. Um, there's a query editor, 
which looks very much like data log. I always find it interesting in the closure community, everyone mentions data log, they never mention Sparkle, which is the semantic web standard and is equally, I guess they all are based on Prolog um, <laughs> eventually. But it's, it's funny how every community just refers to the same kind of reference points over and over. In JavaScript, no one has ever heard of, of Datomic. They all just know GraphQL, that's it. <laughs> and it's like, not so, and I sometimes really think we, we are totally living the Tower of Babel, where all those different communities are so insular because the entire community just spends their entire life within those mural boxes. And um, I really, that's why I kind of became a traveler because I like diving in and out from those different discussions more. Um, this was here done during a workshop. Maybe some of you actually came to my home where we did that. That was a two day workshop or three day workshop, can't remember, where we built this uh, price map of London house prices. Again, all based on uh, linked data. And then we built lots of like secondary charts like this where you could really explore per borrow and just learn how to create those kind of graphs all. Uh, that's another airport map also done during that same workshop. Um, I'm not doing this about, uh, there's a very interesting approach that how to define color gradients, but I'm not going into this now. Um, the next thing really, <laughs> I will actually have to skip this as well. I'm sorry we don't have enough time. I'm talking too slowly. Um, I want to get to this point here now. So my personal experience report with Clojure after having worked pretty much day and night with it for seven years. Um, in 2015, I kind of wrote this massive long blog post at the end of the year just kind of documenting my thoughts, like where I've been and blah. And I came across this quote, and Alexander Stepanov is one of the, if not the main author of the C++ standard library. So I really value his opinion. And that quote ever stuck with me since. And I think no matter what language you work with, if it's the, a uh, new kit on the block everyone hypes about if you are doing assembly <laughs> from the 80s, it doesn't matter. We should never forget that. And I think especially in the functional world where we absolutely love our abstractions to death, <laughs> they might actually really mean the death of us eventually if we, if we are not keeping an eye on this aspect. Um, I also like, maybe you remember from an earlier slide, when I grew up with computers, I really absolutely loved a language called Forth, which is actually no language because you make it up yourself. Um, but the inventor of Forth, um, he, he, I, I really recommend reading up on him. I'm not agreeing with everything he says because he's a complete tour de force, but his solutions to existing computer science problems are absolutely mind-blowing. <laughs> and he really can do things with 1% the code where you just think like, how on earth? <laughs> how is that possible? So, um, but back to the joy of closure. So again, this is just rehashing from what we had earlier here. Um, I absolutely love all those things, but at the same time, some of them, which in the beginning of my kind of living with closure, their strength in the end turned out not problems, but really uphill battles. Like for instance, with the geometry library, I spent months, months and months trying to optimize those internal vector data types so you can actually use, work with points just like you can work with numbers. And to make this fast and to make this work both in closure script and in, in closure, it's just it's a lot of effort. And while working on this and also on other things, like I did this uh, kind of any dimensional matrix library, which somehow ended up in core matrix. I don't know if this is still going. 
I guess it is. Um, but this was all macros on macros on macros to, to generate the code to, and there you kind of really get into the yeah, quirky bits of Clojure, like the undocumented stuff. I don't know if ever of you has ever read the Clojure source code, but it's hard, <laughs> it's hard reading. Um, and this is absolutely, it's no criticism, it's just, I think, there we need more community involvement in addressing those things. And I think the community, if we celebrate now 11 years this year, yeah, then aren't we mature enough to really like kind of hold those things by the whatever <laughs> and, and really deal with them in a grown up way rather than all this like flame war stuff going on at the moment. Um, it's just questions. I'm not pointing fingers at anyone or it's also no dis disservice to the authors or ungratefulness. It's really the opposite. But maybe some of you know this quote. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes working on those other problems, it felt like this. The exact opposite. And it shouldn't be like this because the language generally is exactly the opposite. But there are certain parts of when you really try to tickle out and kind of make it work for you in some cases, it's not, it becomes the opposite. And I, if I had to kind of summarize those things in a more general thing, again, outside close or some of them, like just a fundamental thing, I don't always want immutability by default, not for the problems I work on. That I, I completely understand there are so many problems where you do want it and where it's the right default, but there's equally an entire number of worlds where you do not want it at all, at no cost, because it, it destroys user experience, it destroys resources, it, you just don't want it. And I, I cannot kind of, this became actually one of the biggest problems for me in closure for my work and why I kind of slowly drifted searching for other things because it's just too much effort to kind of swim against the stream which is kind of predefined for you. And there I have been thinking then and that's what I've been kind of working on recently for the last two years, like on and off in my little spare time, is to kind of take some of those ideas from closure, but really just the same philosophy like closure does, add things by library, but there's no more core, everything is just library and you can kind of pick and mix, mix the features you want. So you want immutability for a project, here are your data structures. You want multi-methods for a project, here's your library. You want this and this, so you can kind of assemble everything on the fly and you can still largely work with the same concepts you know from closure, but you don't, you are, you are only tied to the way of thinking, but you are not tied to the language. And I think for me personally, this is something I want to um, inquire further. How much time do I have left? Two minutes. Um, yeah, so speaking of immutability is another Charles Moore quote. <laughs> I think that's very true as well. Um, just very quickly, a, another wish, and is more or less throwing a question into the room. Here we have quick treatment of multi-methods for, for instance, vector addition. So we define a multi-method. Yeah, in this case, arbitrary length vectors, anything 2D, 3D, 4D, 20D, doesn't matter. If you do Machine learning, this is one of your bread and butter operations, for instance, not just for drawing funny pictures. So in, in closure script, for instance, if I do this here, a 2D implementation idiomatically, 10 million iterations, that will take me 3.3 seconds, which is unbelievably bad, um, in my opinion, in this day and age. If I do 3D vectors, it turns into almost four seconds, and if I use native arrays instead of closure script vectors, I can cut it down to almost half, which is great, but then 
we have to use JavaScript arrays everywhere on our code base. No one does that. It's a nightmare. So <laughs> it's not a real solution. Um, likewise, now adding arbitrary length versions. So here we have an eight dimensional vector. Yeah. Could be a tiny neural network, <laughs> which you want to somewhere uh, perform something. How can you justify that this takes 36 seconds suddenly? A jump in basically four times the vector size, which took 3.3 3 seconds, now four times larger suddenly takes you 10 times longer? How? <laughs> this is bad. And I think there is really work to be done in this case. For instance, you can then start here not using map v, which is the idiomatic thing to do. Yeah, we have vectors as inputs. Of course, I use map v. This is the first thing. If you manually loop and, and use transients and then all that stuff where you hardly any more see where your actual code is, like the actual code is this part here. Everything else is just boilerplate, which, you know, this is for me, it still is closure, but this is how you optimize closure at the moment. And I think we need better solutions around those kind of problems. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, that's a task for you guys. <laughs> um, so, but I mean, look at the impact. Now we are down to 15 seconds from 36. This is amazing. But then that's also kind of as good as it gets. And now look at the same kind of concept just using plain standard ES6 on which closure script runs anyway. So we have our def multi. Okay, we dispatch by the length of the first argument. We have the same thing, yeah, this the two dimensional thing. This only takes 544 milliseconds instead of 3.3 seconds. How is that possible? 3D version, only 20 milliseconds longer or 40 milliseconds longer instead of 100, and generally six times faster than the closest script version, six times. The generic one, 50 times faster with the same kind of code. I mean, you know, how, how can you justify a 50 times difference? Um, I think, and again, I know when you write your normal React application form, fill a form here, scroll a table there, this kind of stuff, absolutely no matter. But what I'm trying to say is there is a set of problems and applications and use cases in the world for which this is everything. And if we have the, I always believe my entire life, use the right tool for the right job. And I think the future of closure for me personally is, uh, not this, this is just for you to check out, you're welcome, but um, the, f the future for me is to think about how closure and closure scripts fits in this kind of poly, more polyglot approach of working. Because what I don't want is that closure turns into an institution like so, like has happened with so many other things we have built. Institutions always start out cool and for the benefit of the people, but at some point they either become churches or they turn actively against those who actually are supposed to uh, benefit. So with that thought, merci. <laughs> Do we still have time for questions? Uh, yes, yeah, so we, we can have uh, one or two very, very quick questions. Yeah. Anybody got any burning questions they absolutely have to ask now? Ha put your hands up now or forever, hold your peace. <laughs> Everybody wants, oh, nearly a question. Yes, uh, can we get a microphone up there, please? Run, 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 Abby, run, Abby, run, Abby, run, quick, 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 please. Sorry. Put it back up. Last line. Uh, yes. Yeah, I think this question about immutability being op immutability, op optional or mandatory or kind of default, 
I think there is some point about it because if you have like areas of your code where you can rely on mutability, you can kind of reason about it and mm -hmm. you have advantages. And if you kind of make it too optional, then every piece of code has some mutability in it and you no longer can make these assumptions. Mm -hmm. But it's up to you to introduce those barriers. Yeah. But I want that freedom. And I think, I mean, if I also think, you know, some language like having, I'm not really feeling part of the JavaScript community at all either, because I think they are very insular, much more than, for instance, Clojure is. Like in Clojure, there are, there's cross breeding of ideas going on, always has been, and that's what I think one of the values. But um, I think the Clojure community and the, the people who are operating in here, we are mature enough to know when you make those kind of decisions at large, I would say. You know, like m most people who come to Clojure have programmed in other environments before and you kind of can trust them <laughs> to some extent. No one can ever trust anyone, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't trust myself. Like <laughs> not 100% not maybe, yeah. yes, but uh, okay. Well, uh, th again, uh, an amazing keynote. Thank you very much, Carsten. Thank Big you. round of applause, please. Thank you. Break now. Uh, if we take the break uh, for about 10 minutes and we'll be back here at 10:30, then we're all caught up back to the schedule. Thank you very much. <laughs>